Last night he alluded to in his opening section, he alluded to the eschatological nature of marriage and how it applies to this situation. But given the nature of, a, of, of the debate and the time constraints, he didn't really get to elucidate what he was saying there. It was just so important and so good. So I thought, Stephen, do that now. And then he and I are just going to do some Q&A uh, with you. And, and, and I'm sure uh, Chad has plenty to offer on this as, as well from his pastoral experience. So we can just have a conversation here uh, with, with one another. But what, what were you getting at yeah. last night? So, yeah. I'm sorry. Could you turn on your, your mic? I just, I don't know if I turned it on. Push and hold the button. I don't know why. Let me see here. Power button there. Push and hold it and then I'll turn green. It's on now. All right. Sorry about that. No problem. So yeah, I, I find so often these debates, it's uh. It's a question of, well, did God really say? Yep. It, we get into these micro details of a verse, and can we find a way around the verse? And it's, it becomes ethics in some ways unmoored <laughs> from the rest of the biblical picture. Mm. And uh, I've been uh, you know, studying Ventil, including with you over this past summer. Yeah. Um, but, but, but along the, this, this strange idea that we can He's got a paper due for me in about a month, by the way, so pray for him. We can't do ethics in a vacuum. Yeah. It's always related um, to, the, to everything we believe, including our epistemology yeah. and our theology. And so uh, when we think about marriage, it's too often we're like teenagers. So that, that's what I find a lot of this debate as well. Okay, I'm, I'm starting to date. Well, how far can we go? Well, like if that's your question, you're asking the wrong question. <laughs> that's not even where we start. That's not where we start from. Uh, and so this wonderful idea that there's no brute facts. So that, broadly speaking, there's nothing that's neutral in the world. Everything has its own purpose. Uh, and it's only possible purpose can come from the one who defines all purpose, which is God himself. And, and so big picture, we get, as, uh, as we quoted from Ventil, the self-contained ontological trinity. Mm -hmm. uh, in eternity, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the covenant of peace between each other, who make a covenant of redemption. We're going to create a people and we're going to have them to be the bride for my son. And Jesus is going to be the eternal mediator of that covenant. And, and the growing picture we're going to get of that is of, indeed, a groom and his bride. And so when God begins to create then, and he says, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, create in our image, male and female. And the first thing that the three-in-one God says is, the two shall become one. And so we can see right from the very beginning that God has some plan. There is, there is more than just a utilitarian purpose. This is more than, well, this is going to be useful for you. This is going to help you feel good. It's going to help you navigate life. Uh, there is some purpose behind what is God, God is doing in gender and sexuality and in marriage. And they're interrelated. Mm. And so, you know, when I do pre marriage counseling, we talk about sexuality at a certain point. And we say sexuality is first and foremost a picture of this unity. Unity is the, is the central component. The two shall become one flesh. And that physical reality is a, is a picture, a consummation of the spiritual reality. Jesus says, what God puts together in marriage, let man not separate. And sexuality in that context has, has almost a sacramental function within the marriage bond. That it's making present in, in a real form and reaffirming the vows, the covenant reality between husband and wife. But then, of course, as the scriptures then progress, we begin to see hints that God has a bigger picture in mind for marriage, particularly. He starts to talk about his relationship with Israel as that of a husband and a wife, of, of adultery as a form of, of spiritual adultery, which is really idolatry, Ezekiel 16. And that image keeps going, but it's not fully formed yet, really until we get to the New Testament. And then we start to see that marriage, in fact, had a trajectory uh, temporarily, there was a biological trajectory. Uh, the three-in-one God who creates in his image creates two who become one, who can then become co-creators with God within the marriage bond. And the ultimate seed of that is going to be the seed of the woman. Not many seeds, the seed, Jesus himself. He's the culmination of that reality. But the purpose of that was not biological, ultimately, it was spiritual. That Jesus then would be able to have this bride for himself. And that's where we see Paul going, especially Ephesians chapter 5. That marriage was really this spiritual picture of this invisible reality, the mystery, is really about Christ and the church. And then we get to Revelation. 
And so when we step back and we start to think, okay, what is marriage? What is sexuality? What is gender? You have to look not merely at what it was, not merely how it feels, but you have to look at where it's going. And that's where mm -hmm. I think things like complementarity are really important. Mm -hmm. I think one of, the, one of the effects of that is that since marriage is, is a picture of the gospel, in fact, I think it's a sign of the gospel, almost in the sense that the Old Testament temple and sacrificial system were signs of the coming of Christ. And I think we especially know that because Jesus himself says that when the sign becomes the reality, when the consummated of the new creation, the sign won't be needed anymore. There's not going to be marriage in the new heavens and the new earth. We're going to have the reality. We're going to have Christ. And so marriage is not a permanent reality. It's a temporary reality. It's pointing to the reality. It's a shadow of something. And, and so any time that it's not accomplishing that ultimate purpose of pointing to that reality, it's like taking temple worship and saying, well, you know what? Temple worship was fine. I know God has his own purpose. You know what? We have, we have better ideas. Uh, some of Aaron's sons tried that. They had some better ideas about how temple worship should run. Uh, God was not real happy <laughs> with that. one essence in the man and the woman in the marriage relationship first, right? Yes. Okay. And you said that, that the starting point is three things. A self-contained ontological trinity. So in order to understand the, the significance of the one being a reflection of, of the first, what is a, what does it mean to be self-contained? What does ontological mean? And explain the basis of the Trinity and how that connection is so important. So it, it sounds like a fancy term, but, it, but it's really in some sense not. It's, it's the simple question. Um, we have this idea of causation in our world. Um, everything has a cause. The universe must have a cause, but for there to be a cause, something has to be uncaused. Uh, God has no cause. God is. I am that I am. He has neither beginning nor end. Uh, he needs nothing. He requires nothing. There's nothing outside of God uh, that can in any way, shape, or form <laughs> contain him or restrict him or that he's reliant on. And so in that sense, he is utterly self-contained, utterly self-reliant, utterly self-sufficient. He is perfect reality, perfect truth, perfect love, perfect peace, perfect joy. Anything that can or, or does exist only exists because it comes from himself in his own nature, as he is. An ontology is simply God in his own essence, uh, not God in relationship to anything else. So not God as creator, but God as who he is in himself eternally, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, and, and that's important because that's the only way we can have an ultimate ground upon which we can know or believe or have anything. If there isn't such a God, then we can't have any reality. Mm -hmm. If there isn't such a God, we can't have any truth. If there isn't such a God, we can't have any knowledge. And I, I don't think we have time to go into all the philosophy behind that. Uh, but it's, it's really important. Mm -hmm. If we don't have a God who knows everything, we can't actually know anything. Mm -hmm. wow. And that's a really important principle. And so all the knowledge we have is, I think as Ventil would say, is we're just thinking God's thoughts after him. There's never been an original thought in the history of the world. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun in a very literal way. The best we can do is, is think what God has already fully known and fully understood mm -hmm. in some small way because he's revealed it to us, uh, not because we've discovered it on our own, because it's revealed to us. And so marriage itself in that sense is revealed to us and it's revelatory. Mm -hmm. And it can't possibly be useful or helpful if it's unmoored from the reality for which it was created. Like, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. And so when we start talking about, well, people feel and people think and people want, like, that's fine. But if we're unmoored from the reality upon which all reality is grounded, <laughs> then it's not reality, then it's not helpful. It cannot be at a very fundamental level. 
And so one of the problems I think that we've really missed, and I think this is just a symptom. Same-sex marriage is a symptom of a much bigger problem. We all know that. All sexual sin, I think, is a, is a lie mm -hmm. about Christ and the church and the gospel. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, a lie about the Trinity even. You know, when, when we talk about same-sex marriage, I think one of the, one of the gross lies is that, that Jesus doesn't want to save a church. Jesus would be perfectly happy being with one like himself. Mm -hmm. and, and even a more pernicious lie, that the church doesn't need Christ. Mm -hmm. That the church could be satisfied and find its salvation in one like itself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a fundamental lie about the nature of salvation. Yeah. <laughs> Christ came to save us, and we are, can only be saved in Christ. Yeah. Uh, and I think all sexual sin is like that. Adultery. Can you imagine Christ cheating on his spouse, the bride? Inconceivable. Mm -hmm. And that's why God takes idolatry so very seriously. It's spiritual adultery. That's a clear image in the Old Testament. And, and so every time, these things are not neutral. Mm. They're not independent. They're not, well, this works for me, or this is helpful for me, or you know, I can decide for myself. Uh, there's no such thing as neutral things. There's no brute facts. There's no autonomous people. There's mm -hmm. no autonomous actions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all created for a purpose. It's all headed for a purpose. And when we're off of that trajectory, we cannot help <laughs> but hurt. Even if it's practically speaking making us feel good, it's still lying to us and it's lying to others. And that has consequences, really serious consequences. Because bad ideas, as you've said, has, have consequences. And, uh, and I think we're, now we're starting to see, because mm -hmm. I know Ryan was trying to argue, and, and I, again, I appreciate Ryan's hard lot. He sees people hurting. We don't want to see people hurting. <laughs> yeah. But if we start lying about Christ and the gospel, people are going to hurt a lot more. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's when there's going to be no hope. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the lie really comes in when you were told, unless you offer them what I'm offering them, you don't really care that they're hurting. To say that by accommodating or affirming, I'm the one who really cares about the fact that they're hurting. You won't affirm, therefore you don't care that they're hurting. It's like, no, I care that they're hurting. I don't want to affirm something that's going to make them hurt even worse, even eternal condemnation. So yeah. last night when we were looking at, say, the Leviticus 18.22 text, um, and we can talk about this here in a second because the effort was made to say that only applies to some kind of pagan worship, pagan temple setting. Um, it's actually no, it, 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 it's called an abomination and is appended with condemnation. And so if you really care about someone hurting, okay, loneliness, not being able to satisfy sexual desire, that is, I mean, to say no to the flesh involves denial. It, it, yeah, it's painful. But how much worse to say, go ahead and indulge that and face a much more severe consequence, right? So... I was diagnosed in December as type 2 diabetes, okay? So y'all probably noticed me trying to, snack, uh, trying to sneak some of these cookies and cakes and stuff and Diane swooping in. And it wasn't because <laughs> Diane is just an ogre trying to deny me of palatable ecstasy. Um, she's trying to keep me from facing a worse consequence. So it's a consequence. I don't get to indulge the way that Y'all are just in my face eating cookies and <laughs> donuts and right in front of me. I don't get to indulge that. So I'm, in a sense, suffering. But let's say that y'all just said, oh, I don't want him to suffer. Let's go ahead. And I just start eating that and eating that. And 10 years from now, my sight's blurry or my fingers are numb or something like that. And so I basically eat like cardboard and bark now. But anyway, <laughs> but I do that too. So you, you understand my point. Now, Stephen's point here about marriage is really, really crucial. And I know it's kind of deep. And you may think that's esoteric and really, really theological. Well, all of life is theological. But here's the thing. Because marriage is eschatological, marriage itself is not simply a social contract. It is not a social construct. And it's not merely utilitarian. Marriage is an analogy to the gospel and God's redemptive plan of the relationship of Christ the bride to the uh, bridegroom to, to the church the bride marriage is not something that man cooked up because if it was then all men would have a right to it and an ability to define it refine it whatever recruit you know reimage it it is ultimately a picture 
of the gospel. It is a spiritual eschatological reality. So when we say that we do not affirm gay marriage, it's not that we're simply a bunch of crusty fundamentalists who want to deny the right of anybody to love whoever they want to love. Or that we want to deny people the right to sexual engagement or companionship or cure their loneliness. No, we're saying, I don't actually have the, we don't have the right to redefine marriage as something that it's not because it's been defined by God as an eschatological spiritual analogy of the church. So, if I want to say on the one hand, like last night, I affirm the authority of the Bible, I affirm uh, the inerrant, well, kind of didn't. Um, but if, if I want to say, as our friend Ryan said, I affirm the Bible, I affirm the authority of God's word, and I also believe in gay marriage. Well, in order to uphold the Bible and also affirm gay marriage, I actually need a different creation account. You follow what I'm saying? I actually have to have a different creation account because the creation account embeds marriage as an analogy of God's ultimate covenantal intentionality involving one man and one woman. And so if I want to say that I affirm the Bible and the Bible says marriage is eschatological and an analogy of the church, the only way that I can then say marriage must also be allowed for same-sex unions, I have to have a different creation account. And I don't have that. Um, at the same, and, and also, I'm going to say this. In order for me to be consistent in saying that um, marriage should be allowed between same-sex partners, um, I actually have no more, if, if I'm going to hold that position, even though the Bible clearly condemns same-sex sexual unions, calls it an abomination, then I really need to be consistent, and I don't mean to be gross here, but I need to be consistent and say that um, human and animal unions should be legalized. Yeah, the Bible condemns that. The Bible condemns bestiality. Though way less often. <laughs> but Do what now? Way less often, though. <laughs> way less often. Way less often. But if I'm going to say, yeah, the Bible, I see that it says it's an abomination for a man to lie with a man as with a woman. But we don't have certainty about that. What is keeping me from saying, yeah, the Bible seems to condemn bestiality, but we don't have a high degree of certainty about that. If I really feel like in order for me to, to have fulfillment, let's say I, I identify as a dog. Why can't I have a sexual union with a dog? All I've got to say is we don't have a high degree of certainty about what the Bible means about bestiality. Because last night when I said it says this and the response was, I went back and watched it on the, on the, on the video last night, but what if you personally don't have certainty that that's what it means then you can go ahead and live the way you want all i've got to say is i don't really have certainty that when the bible speaks against fornication that that means i shouldn't be allowed to have illicit sexual relationship when it speaks about bestiality i don't think i'm not i don't have certainty that that applies to me or adultery i'm sorry i don't think that that means that i necessarily should be all that concerned about cheating on my wife the problem is we need a different creation account if we're going to justify those things. We need a different creation account so that we can have a different biblically justifiable view of marriage. The problem is we don't have a different creation account. And because we have the creation account we have, the doctrine of marriage flows from that, from the garden to the garden city. From Genesis straight through to the maps, this is a spiritual eschatological reality. It's not just a matter of this is a social contract and Christians are being restrictive. They're being unloving and caring. It's like, no. We're saying, we don't define marriage. That's You're defining marriage. No, no, I'm actually not. I'm not defining marriage. Because I, I think that's a really fascinating point because, because really, once you give yourself the, the autonomy to define anything, yeah. you've actually unmoored yourself from God's authority utterly. What did Nietzsche say? Like, there's no Have we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving now? Away from all sons? Nietzsche was saying, yeah. We are moving away from all authority. So really, either God has the only authority to define, yep. in which case, I mean, it doesn't matter what I feel or think. It doesn't matter. I, I simply have no right to define it. So, or ability. Here we say, either God has all the authority to define, or what? The serpent in the garden, ye shall be as gods. Yeah, right. And before he said, 
notice the serpent didn't slide and say, hey, guys, I, I don't have a lot of time. I can only say one thing to you. You can be God. He didn't do that. How did he come in? Has God really said? He didn't begin by suggesting to our first parents that they could be their own gods. He began by questioning the certitude and authority of God's special revelation. And it's, and it's really quite fascinating how the serpent does it. I, I find that, that that text is just so interesting. Yeah. Because ultimately, because we see it all around us now, what, what the serpent doesn't say is, I have an alternate word that you should trust. He, he's not that stupid. Yeah. He's really sly. Yeah. What he's really saying is, why, why don't you stop listening to the voice of God that has come to you authoritatively and absolutely from outside of yourself? And why don't you say, you know what, that, that apple looks pretty good. Yeah. What do your desires tell you? What do your feelings tell you? Don't you, don't you want knowledge? Yeah. Don't, don't you want to choose for yourself? And he tells us to look within. Don't you want to know good from evil? And, and, and so it's really this, this move from listening to the external voice of God to listening to the internal voice of ourselves and saying, I'm going to decide. Yeah. I'm going to decide what's good. I'm going to decide what's desirable. I'm going to decide what's true. Yeah. And of course, it's a disaster because it turns out we have, mm -hmm. we have no ability to do those things. Yeah. And, it's, and we're, we're terrible gods. Yep. And they, they already knew good from evil, mind you. They'd been told what was good and evil. And you're right, the serpent would come and say, I know you've been told this, but let me, I've got another document about good and evil, and let me convince you of that. He just turns them inward. Turns them says, inward. you can be your own gods. And the entire cultural moment we live in is, don't listen to any voice outside of yourself, especially God's. Just listen to that voice inside. That, that's, yeah. that's the only truth. And the central tenet of Marx was all authority in the family and society must be demolished. Um, Marx would have had a hard time getting a hearing. It would have been, for most people, erudite kind of, or, or kind of esoteric, academic. But when Freud comes along and makes it about sex, I'm in. You got my attention now. Make sense? So that, that sort of history of ideas we talked about, this has not simply been the long march of Marxism through the institutions. It has been the long march of Marxism, Freudianism, the Frankfurt School of Economics. It's been the long march of the French intellectuals, Simone de Beauvoir, Jean-Paul Sartre, Jean-Francois Léotard, uh, Albert Camus, Michel Foucault. It's been the long march of these philosophical systems through the institution. They have all, kind of at a theoretical level, do away with Christianity, Nietzsche's will to power, and in case that bores you because it seems so esoteric, how does it play out? At that which is most central to our sense of self, our sexuality. Why did Jesus say every, man, every sin a man commits, he commits outside himself, but he who commits, uh, who commits sexual sin sins against himself? Why did he say that? Because our sexuality is so core to who we are as image bearers of God because it's tied into God's eschatological purpose for the church. That's why Jesus says sexual sin is different than, say, thievery or whatever, you know, some other, some other kind of sin, all deserving of, of judgment. And yet sexual sin is what? It is at the core of who I am, created imago dei, me saying, I am God and you are not. God, hold my beer and watch this. Watch what I engage in. Right. So when and here's the thing, we, we've made this much about the gender issue, but I told a group of 300 dads at the academy down in Nashville about a month and a half ago. I said, a lot of you dads are wondering, what can you do for the academy? You know, what can you do for the academy? Can you donate money to the academy? Can you help on cleanup days on the campus? Can you do this? Do that? I said, here's what I need from you. And they were all there where there's a 300 men with their sons. Uh, it was an athletic event. We got a pre-K through 12, 1,400 students. So you got ostensibly 2,800 parents. And so there's a lot of people, right? But this was an athletic event. You had 300 dads with their sons. So there was hundreds of people here. And I said in front of their sons, I said to the dads, you really want to know what you, you can do for this academy? I said, dads, listen to me. Give up porn right now. Repent and begin a lifestyle of repentance in the area of pornography. Stop clicking on it. Because your children know whether or not you're looking at porn. They can see it in your eyes and you know it. Give up on porn. Repent of pornography. Secondly, give your kids the knowledge that their dads only look at their wives. Because when you're out at a store, you're out here, you're out there, you're at the gym, I promise you, your kids are watching 
if you, you know, try to give that checking a woman up and down. I said this to a group of men. And I said, thirdly, give me a group of men whose wives don't have to drag their, uh, their backsides out of the bed on a Sunday morning and get them to church. You men lead your family to church and let your kids see you sing the hymns and pray. Let them see you worship. Give me those three things and renewal is going to happen. It's pretty straightforward. The number of the, the response that I got from that, frankly, from men who are like, I've just been waiting for somebody to smack me in the, in the mouth. I've been waiting for somebody to punch me in the mouth about that thank you. Right? The number of women who <laughs> actually came around and said, my husband told me what they heard. Right? So here's what's my point. When we engage in sexual sin, not just these flags or LGBT, but when we engage in sexual sin, we are saying, I am God and you are not. I am redefining marriage. Because in redefining, in redefining what God says about sexual, a biblical sexual ethic, I am actually attempting to redefine God himself. Here's the problem with rede trying to redefine God. God says, take your best shot. I am immutable. I am unchangeable. I am from eternity to eternity. You're going to wear yourself out trying to be, in other words, like the Hulk bashed Loki and said, puny God. Thankfully, God doesn't bash us around and say, puny God. He says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. He draws it to himself. But he says in Leviticus 18, 22, if a man lies, the man of the woman, it is an abomination. Now, I want to say something here real quickly because this was brought up last night. Um, so uh, read, if you will, uh, Leviticus 18, 22 for us. So Leviticus 18, 22 and I'm, gonna make, I'm not going to get into the deep weeds here, but I want to make a couple of comments so that you will know that the common attempts to reinterpret a couple of key passages simply cannot stand lexically. By that I mean there are no standard lexicons written by Christians or non-Christians, either one, of Hebrew and Greek that will allow for the interpretations that over the last 20 years have been foisted upon these texts. So 18, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Very right. short and simple. Very short and simple. The F is a car lo, shikav, mishikave, isha, toyava, yua. Toyava in the Hebrew is the word that is used there. Uh, the assertion was made last night. And please understand, there's a difference between asserting something and accounting for something. I can assert anything. I can assert that I'm the cookie monster, right? Well, I guess maybe there's evidence for that because I have, <laughs> I have, I can either confirm or deny the report that I may have eaten a couple. We can assert anything. Accounting for something is different. I can reject your argument, right? If we're debating, I can roll my eyes at you. I can, psh, you can believe, whatever. I can reject your argument, but that's not a refutation. It is not. Okay. So to assert that, that ultimately that verse there doesn't apply to all of life. It, the, the, the standard argument now is that was something that only applied to the people of God engaging in temple worship, in, in pagan temple worship. The problem is that that word uh, here, uh, toyeva, is not in any Hebrew lexicon a technical word that refers only to pagan temple settings. In fact, the word here that, that we have for abomination, it, it's, it's, you know, uh, an abomination here, is actually also used in verses 26, 29, and 30 of the same chapter. And these aren't directed at temple service, services at all. So why is the one that's related to homosexual acts suddenly only a reference to pagan temple worship? That is an example not of exegesis, but eisegesis, of reading something into the text that's not there. Does that make sense? In other words, it's not allowed according to the actual meaning of the word. Okay, so, so similarly, uh, and, and this is, this is the, the, other, um, the other thing that you'll hear, is in the text of Genesis 19, when the men of Sodom 
come to Lot's house. And there are the angels there. And they look at them. And they are desirable. And you remember what they wanted to do? They said, bring them out to us that we might know them. Know them. That we might know them. Now, those who are affirming and want to sort of reinterpret this to say, that's not, we should never have called it sodomy because you know, sodomy laws, i.e. Uh, men lying with the men and engaging in, in um, anal intercourse, sodomy, it's, that's gotten a bad rep because of a misinterpretation of this text because what the, what the Hebrew actually means is bring them out that we might rough them up or bring them out that we might beat them up. Now, Here's why knowing a little Hebrew is important. All right? In Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, Adam, Yadah, his wife. That is a calperfect third masculine singular, the word Yadah. And guess what happened then? Vethahar. Vethahar. That is a calvav consecutive third singular female, a feminine, meaning she conceived. Adam knew his wife, Yadah, and she conceived. The same word is used in Genesis 19, 5. Bring them out. And the word here is Venedaya. It is a cal imperfect first plural cohortative that we might know them. It's actually a version of the same word used in Genesis 4, 1. Adam, Yadah, he knew his wife, sexual relation what they are saying it's not that Adam beat his wife up or abused her and she conceived no he engaged sexually with her had a sexual intercourse and she conceived the same word is used in Genesis 19:5. there is no reason and there is no lexical context in which it means beat up or or abuse it simply means either to know cognitively, to know like, I know you're wearing a gray coat, or I know that you're a pastor, or to know sexually. The same word is used here. The point of these men of Sodom is that they wanted to sodomize the angels, which I would assure you would be a bad idea. You do not mess around with angels, all right? They had no idea what they were about to get themselves into. And in fact, what was Lot's solution? No, instead of them, take my daughters and do what you want with them. This was a purely, which was awful, but this is a purely sexual context. The, the context was sexual. The meaning of the word is sexual. And so you can't say it means this here sexually. They, they weren't saying, bring them out that we might know facts about them. No, it was that we might know them sexually. So that's a second thing that you'll often hear is that in the, the story of Genesis 19, this was not the men wanting to engage sexually um, in a way that Leviticus 18, 22 denies. Then, then finally, let's... let's and, and maybe just a comment on that one, because mm -hmm. even if there was any doubt about those things, the New Testament twice specifically tells us that the issue with the men of Sodom was their yeah. sexual immorality. Yeah, yeah. Explicitly, both, both from Peter and in, and in Jude. Yeah, and Peter and Jude, thank you. You know, like they likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire. Yep. And so the New Testament explicitly tells us yep. what it meant. Exactly. If there was any doubt. Which is if there was any doubt. So how does the New Testament... In other words, are Peter and Jude better interpreters of the Old Testament? Or is a postmodernist uh, gay-affirming pastor a better interpreter of the Old Testament? I'd go with Peter and Jude. I'd go with Peter and Jude, all right? Secondly, very quickly, Jesus, Matthew 19, 3-12, and Mark 10, 2-12, speaks about marriage. In that, he affirms what Stephen was saying about marriage's original design between a man and a woman. In other words, Jesus never described or prescribed marriage as between same-sex couples. People say, well, he never, he never spoke directly against same-sex union. Well, that's called an argument from silence. What did he speak in favor of, of course, was uphold, upholding the law of God. And then I think maybe the most confusing thing, and this is what you're going to hear the most, all right? This is what you are going to hear more often than anything else, and we touched on it last night, but ever so briefly, I'll say this quickly, and then Aaron, get to your, your question there, and I, we probably have maybe 10 minutes left here uh, at, at most. Um, in, in the New Testament, in, in Paul's writings, 
in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 1 Timothy 1, 10. So could you read 1 Corinthians 6, 9? So do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, that's the word pornea, uh, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor, and the SV says, men who practice homosexuality. But there's actually two words in the Greek there. Yeah, men who practice homosexuality, I think it's like some other translations. Uh, Old, Old King James would say sodom, sodomites, all right? Because that's what it was called for the longest time. And some will say, well, the word homosexual did not appear in a Bible until uh, 1948 in the RSV. True enough, true enough. Because, or in the 50s, in the RSV, because true enough, the word homosexual, we don't see it in print until 1948. That doesn't mean, however, that the word itself doesn't mean what a later word developed in the English language came, came to mean. Okay, so to say that that word didn't exist until the 40s, it's been read back into the scripture, and that's not what the word means. Well, I don't care how, whether you call it homosexuality or sodomy, what does the Greek itself mean? That's what we want to ask, okay? Yeah. That's what we want to ask. So 1 Timothy 1.10 says what? Exact same word there. It's the exact same word. And th this is very important because this was alluded to last night. And I didn't want to unpack it because it, it would have, it's just, it's just too devastating a critique, honestly. So again, uh, so the sexually immoral men who practice homosexuality, uh, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever yep. else is contrary to sound doctrine. Okay, so in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, the word is arsenikoitai. Arsenikoitai is nominative, pl uh, nominative masculine plural of arsenikotai. All right. 1 Timothy 1.10, the word that is there is in the nominative uh, masculine plural dative of arsenikotai. Now that's just a lot of technical stuff, but here's the thing. The word arsenikoitai. Last night, it was suggested that that word means pedophilia. Or you'll often hear it say that what Paul is against here is not loving, consensual male and male sexual an abusive intercourse, but abuse like rape or uh, abusive dominant like master slave, or master or slave kind of thing. You'll hear those. Do those things exist in Rome? They existed in Rome. Is Paul opposed to rape and abuse? Well, of course, <laughs> right? Is that what this word means? No. Can I prove it? Yes. Paul was a student of the Old Testament. He was himself rabbinically trained. Paul himself was not only Paul, Gentile name, Saul, his Jewish name, he would, like most educated Jews of his day, not only been able to read Hebrew, but they mostly would have read and quoted, as you see in the New Testament, the majority of the quotations in the Old Testament are not from the Hebrew Old Testament, but from what? The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, which is what most Hebrews read because of the diaspora for centuries they were Greek, most Jews were Greek speaking, and they would have known their Old Testaments, not because they read the Hebrew, they would have known their Old Testament, certainly by the time of the apostles, because of the, the familiarity and the spread of the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is the Septuagint. Now, the word arsenikoitai, which is the word Paul uses here in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 1 Timothy 1, 10, Paul is lifting that, or creating that compound word, are you ready for this? From the Septuagintal translation of the Hebrew of Leviticus 18, which we read earlier, and Leviticus 20, verse 13. And so he coins this phrase, arsenikotai, based on two words that appear in the Greek translation of the Hebrew version of Leviticus 18, 22, and 2013. Those words are arsane, and I hinted at this last night, arsane, man, and koimesis, lying together sexually. Paul knew good and well that when he said arsenikotai, those who, who practice, those who are, who, who are, if I can say it this way, arsenikotizers, I'm sort of anglicizing the word here. Arsenikotai will not inherit the kingdom of God because they are the what? They are the men, arsane, who koimesis, lie sexually with other men. That was not in Leviticus at all any kind of pedophilic connotation. Paul was taking words that had no man-boy love, which he certainly would have been against, He's taking words that had no man-boy love connotation in Leviticus, using them in his letter to the Corinthians. We, 
in an effort to justify man and man lying together sexually are reading back into it something that most people would be against pedophilia but it doesn't exist Does that make sense are you following me there but here's my question and i don't mean to be uncouth but if my hermeneutical and theological methodological principle is well if i'm not certain that this applies to me or if i'm feeling this or i'm feeling that and I am willing to take clear commands of Scripture that are appended with condemnation. And given the fact that I don't see any clear statement of Scripture that says I cannot indulge sexual activity with a child, why are you going to hold against me my minor attraction? And by the way, don't call me a pedophile. Call me a map, a minor attracted person. Which it's is a growing movement. It's a growing a movement. Problem. So let me ask, are there any questions on the Greek or Hebrew on those three main texts that, uh, that get twisted and thrown up at you? Any questions there? If you want, I can send you pages and pages and pages of tiny Hebrew and Greek fonts from lexical data that uh, that looks, you know, something similar. Let me let me find an example of it here. If 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 you need this, or, or you can get Robert Gagnon's book. Or yeah, Robert goes into this very extensively. Very, very extensively. My my point is this: I am not just making stuff up and giving you my my opinions here. I am actually giving you lexical lexically informed data. And if and if you need it, I can send you pages and pages of material that look like that all right it's blinding there's so much of it it's, it's blinding and meaning this it's simply irrefutable if you're interested okay so Aaron so the affirming yeah yeah Not my current roommate, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> They're not, they wouldn't call themselves affirming believers. No, they? no. They would not affirm same-sex activity. And to be uh, fair, affirming people wouldn't say that they're affirming sin. They would say they're, that, that they're affirming people who are not sinning. Yeah, yeah that's the thing. In order, in, for Christians who want to say we're holding to the Bible, and I'm, a, I'm an affirming Christian, I affirm same-sex marriages, etc., cetera, uh, cohabitation, etc., in order to say I hold to the Bible like our friend did last night, he has to redefine, he has to redefine um, sin as not sin in order to affirm not just that they're a person created in the image of God, but to affirm their lifestyle activities. Now notice the inconsistency that took place last night. When I described my former roommate and talked about how I respected the fact that he has lived a celibate life, faced loneliness, now for 52 years, I think, faced loneliness, has lived a completely celibate lifestyle. Did you hear him say, and what a hero he is? Well, why is that heroic? Because you've been affirming the whole night the rights of gay Christians to engage sexually. So why is him not engaging sexually laudable? You can't live out you can't live out in a, an unbiblical world you consistently. Did y'all catch that? Now, I wasn't going to say, I wasn't going to expose that right there. There are a number of things that I just let slide. But did that, did that make sense? Why is that laudable? That a, a same-sex attracted Christian who, who decides, I'm going to live a celibate lifestyle out of, out of devotion to the Lord. Why should someone who is a gay-affirming Christian, that actually that actually mitigates against their position. Does that make sense? They shouldn't laud that. They should see that as suspect because they should say to that person, you should indulge your desires because if you don't indulge your desires, that mitigates against my position that same-sex Christians should engage in sexual relationships. Furthermore, if that's going to be my, my point of view, and I am going to deny the authority or reinterpret the Bible 
why would I, why would I laud same-sex marriages? Why wouldn't I just say cohabitate and fornicate? Furthermore, why would I somehow, on what basis, since I've ultimately done away with the authority of the Bible, why, on what basis would I have to laud committed monogamous sexual relationships? Why wouldn't I just say, go out and engage sexually with anyone and everyone? In other words, once you chip away at the epistemological authority of the Bible, all ethical moorings are up for grabs. And so there's always a picking and choosing and an effort to sound like or appear like you are upholding the scripture when in actually you're self-deceived and don't realize, despite, despite your best intentions, that you have utterly said, and I hate to say this, you've utterly said, this book is not my authority. Experience and emotion drives exegesis. And when experience and emotion drive exegesis, the self is superior to the Savior. When experience and emotion drive exegesis, self has now become God. The minute we ask, has God really said, to, to even suggest, there, we can't have, we have low certainty about this. You know what that, you know what that sounds like to me? Has God really said? What you heard last night, was a chilling echo of the first question raised in the garden. I think mean, there's also a dangerous assumption I, that we, we live in a world where sexuality has become so enmeshed with our identity yeah. that the idea of somebody living a chaste life oh. uh, yeah. is, is heroic. Yeah. Can you imagine somebody never engaging in their sexuality? Un Unbelievable. And here's, here's why I'd be willing to say my friend is heroic. I think anyone who fights the good fight against sin, be it sexual sin or anything else, to me that is heroic. It, it, it is heroic in the sense that we are, we are engaging in spiritual warfare. We are taking up the armor of God and we are fighting the good fight. And to me that is heroic. Whatever the sin is, right? Um, and yet we have so elevated the sexual thing to the point of identity that we have, we have said, because this is who I am, uh, I, I must be allowed to, to engage. Well, guess what? You know how I was born? I don't know if y'all know me very well. I was born a liar, a cheater, an adulterer, a murderer. I was born all those things. According to scripture, Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, that's who I am. So don't tell me I can't indulge those things. Yeah. No, I was just, I was just picture what Ryan Craig, I mean, everything you said is exactly right in terms of argumentation of where it leads. Uh -huh. right? And this would have been a good question for Ryan to have ex explained or been asked last night. You know, he, he stops at marriage. Like he'll say, you know, you know, it, it, your your roommate, your former roommate, make sure we make clear, um, your former <laughs> roommate is a hero to him for being celibate. Now, I think he would have encouraged him to be married and all those kind of things, but because mm -hmm. he's not married, I think that's why he calls him a hero. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of make sure we have Ryan's perspective correct. But, yeah, all of the barriers have been knocked down already. And why so, marriage? Well, exactly. Because, I mean, even when we get to Leviticus 18, I mean, the next verse is about bestiality. Yep. I mean, so if you're going to cast, put one into the ceremonial law, you've got to put the next one. Well, right before that, we're talking about incest. Well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, and, Inc and, yeah. and, and, and I think there's a, much, there's a way better biblical case for polygamy than there is for same-sex yeah. marriage. So, so the question becomes Nobody's there. Nobody's advocating for that. While I right. shouldn't say that, polyamory is growing. Yeah, yeah. well, it's true. You, 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 yeah, 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 it is. Um, here's the thing, though. Would um, a gay-affirming pastor who advocates for same-sex marriages and says that, that's where you should express this, are they going to then say... You're not going to find one who's going to say this, I guarantee you. Who's going to say, if a same-sex couple comes to their church, they're living together, they're cohabitating, they're engaging sexually, he's not going to say to them, you know, you can't join this church until you either get married or move out and stop engaging sexually. They're not going to say that. So it's one thing to, to say, well, we advocate for this, we advocate for marriage, but they're not going to say to them, you shouldn't fornicate. You shouldn't fornicate. And so even if somebody wants to say, well, the Bible is unclear on homosexual activity, are they willing to say, and it's also unclear on fornication. Because guess what? 
homosexual sexual activity outside of marriage is fornication just as heterosexual activity outside of marriage is fornication. And to the, to the point of, of affirming, Aaron, I get this sometimes at the academy. We'll have a parent who will come, they'll want to be at the academy, they're interviewing the academy, checking the academy out, and they'll say, my daughter or my son is gay or lesbian or non-binary or gender queer or gender fluid. Are you going to affirm them? So in our school, we're a covenant school, at least one parent has to be a professing Christian. The student doesn't have to be. And I will say to them, oh, by all means, we are going to affirm your child as, a, as, a, uh, as one of our students, as a person created in the image of God. They are going to be loved. They are going to be cared for. They're going to be nurtured. We are going to affirm them, yes, as an imager of God. And part of our loving and affirming them is going to be a refusal to affirm their lifestyle choices or their gender choice. Part of our affirming them is going to be to teach them a biblical sexual ethic about marriage and sexual activity being for the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman in covenant for life. And I'll say that to them. So yeah, we're going to affirm. In other words, I'm not going to allow them to define what affirming means. Because what they mean is unless you celebrate and extol their gender choice or their sexual preference and, and activity, you're not affirming them. So no, no, no. I'm not going to allow you to define affirmation. In fact, I'm going to affirm and I'm going to define affirmation as actually being teaching against that. Because if, if I'm not doing that, I'm not loving them. So do you think um, that the current trend of statistics is more about um, influence and temptation and domination than a rise in this particular... 100%. 100%. 100%. This is an influence. It's an influence, I think, that is a combination of, as Lewis said, as, as, as uh, uh, Wormwood said, to, uh, Screwtape said to Wormwood, we've got propaganda and jargon at our disposal. Don't have them think. Don't have them engage in argument. Let me ask you this. Can you, Sorry? Can you compare that historically to other trends? Like, would you say that's the same for premarital sex as the rise in the 70s and 80s? Yeah, well, I can compare it to a number of things. Let me give you just a couple of examples. Um, let's, let's consider right now one of the things that gets regularly suggested in our current context of, of critical theory and critical race theory. And people will say the new Jim Crow, there's a new Jim Crow because of the mass incarceration of uh, African American individuals. And they'll say that is just simply an example of, of white prejudice and racism continuing. Well, does white prejudice and racism exist? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Is mass incarceration of blacks uh, a symptom of that? No, not at all. Mass incarceration of blacks can be attributed to a historical trend where you can see a difference in percentages. Uh, prior to the 60s, the, the stability of the black home in America, father and mother raising their children, uh, the father working, the mother predominantly raising the children. The stats of uh, marital fidelity and divorce were the same as among white families. When the 60s came and you have legislation that financially incentivizes fatherlessness in black homes, you have, I mean, the stats are there historically. It's just, it's verifiable statistically. You have a dramatic rise in fatherlessness in homes that correlates point for point with the dramatic rise in the percentages of black incarceration. It's not just that suddenly, scientifically, somehow genetically or neurologically, certain people became more criminally oriented. You have, you have a cultural influence on society that produces that. Um, and I'll give you another example of this, okay? Why do we have, since 1973, you have uh, over 65 million babies that have, been, that have been slaughtered in this country? We advocate for it. We protect it at all costs. As I said, one of the holy sacraments of the, the, the state church is abortion on demand. Okay, if we look at the rise in statistics of young girls engaging in pornography, as actresses, as performers. The stats on young girls coming from what we might say affluent homes, not, not they're, they're coming from, 
from uh, desperate poverty and stricken situations engaging in, in uh, the sex industry. The stats on that have risen dramatically with the, the uh, mainstreaming of porn, which rises with the legalization of abortion. They go hand in hand. It's not just that somehow neurologically or genetically, you know, young girls have suddenly become more sexually charged chemically. You can see it corresponding to a cultural reality. Th those are a couple of examples. And I know what I've said may be controversial. And I, I don't say it to be controversial. In fact, for me not to say it would be to buy into the lie that keeps people groups in bondage, that keeps, that keeps people group in bondage to cultural narratives that victimize, okay? Keeps people in cultural, only the gospel frees us up. But that would be a couple of examples there. Now, with the case of the doubling in four years, the doubling since 2017, from 2017 to 21, the doubling of kids who identify on the trajectory of LGBTQ, non-binary, AI2S+, et cetera, is attributable not to the fact that in three to four years, suddenly, chemically, neurologically, there is this genetic difference, scientifically verifiable in kids. No, it's TikTok. Man, it's TikTok, man. It's not genetics, it's TikTok. Right? It's not, it's not science, it's Instagram. So, and why is that, why is that susceptible? Because kids my kids' age, they have not grown up. And frankly, it's not just kids my kids' age. I think it really began with, with, um, with the boomers. If you look back at the greatest generation, say the, the traditionalists, those who fought in World War II or, or were close to that, that age group, it was a time, even still in this country, where in critical thinking was still something that was being engaged in, logic, et cetera. But once you have the cultural revolution of the 60s, the concept of logic and logical argumentation is itself considered oppressive. That's just Western enlightenment, and it's a tool, and now it's just a tool of the patriarchy. So when you insist on logic and critical thinking, well, that's just a tool of the patriarchy, you know? Um, with the, with the de-emphasis on critical thinking, what do you have going on? In our culture, we, we all, boomers, Gen Xers, we grew up on sitcoms. What were sitcoms? A sitcom had a main plot and two throwaway subplots. Because we can't be expected to pay attention to a main plot for the 23 minutes once you take out the advertisements. So we were conditioned, our attention spans were conditioned by sitcoms <clears throat> to need two, sub, two throwaway subplots to endure a main plot for about 23 minutes once you take out the advertisements. Fast forward, Twitter. We now are no longer able to, to sustain argumentation. You gotta hit me with a soundbite, with a tweet. Critical thinking is out the window. And so, I'll close with this, screw tape was right. He, now screw tape wouldn't have to say to Wormwood, don't let them engage in logic and argumentation. Screw tape could say, they don't even know what logic and argumentation is. And newspapers and TV and the BBC, oh Wormwood, we've got propaganda and jargon swirling around, coming out our ears. He would say to Wormwood, sit back and relax. The battle's over. Enjoy the victory lap. That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's why we're, that's why we're going back to Scripture. That's why we're raising these questions and, and, and having these conversations. Look, I know I've said some things, even in the last probably 10 minutes, that are a little bit straightforward. Um, I can verify. I can, I can sustain every bit. I'm not asserting. I can account for every bit of it if you want me to. You, you know, you asked if there are cultural trends that would show shifts, dramatic shifts in percentages that aren't attributable to science, uh, which is what is claimed about the, the gender issue. Well, now, scientifically, it's, it's provable that, that genetically, neurologically, there are more, um, you know, gender trajectory kids. No, it's not science and neurology. It's propaganda and social media. Yeah. I wonder if we have time, maybe just quick fire answers, if there's any questions left. I... Yeah, there was a... Sebastian? Part of me asks um, how much of 
um, uh, your genes and chromosomes being messed up because of sin um, is, yeah, what percentage <clears throat> of people who are going through um, gender crisis or crisis identity mm -hmm. is actually biological? And mm -hmm. how much of it is um, because of what we've just talked about right. today? Yeah, and great, great you know, question. I think that's a moot question. And, and a good book, Planting, I was a professor of the seminary when I was there. So. Yeah, Cornelius Plantinga wrote that book. So here's the thing. My response to Aaron had to do with the percentage, the dramatic increase in percentages not being attributable to genetics or science. Okay, That doesn't mean that I believe, however, that sexual orient, you know, fallen sexual orientations are not also connected to our biochemical makeup. I just don't think there has been a doubling in three or four years that's scientifically uh, attributable, but rather sociological or in terms of social media, et cetera. That said, um, can a person be born with a fallen and broken sexual orientation? Yes, you're looking at him. You're looking at him. Every one of us are born and are we are psychosomatic wholes. We are body and soul. We are both biochemical and we are spiritual. That's the metaphysic of who we are. And so, yes, I do believe that a person's, um, that a person's biology, right, is part of their fallenness, which can contribute to sexual misconduct and sexual disorientation and, and brokenness. However, while that might explain in some cases, it never excuses what the Lord says about it any more than my, uh, my heterosexual orientation and my temptation to sin accordingly that I was born with, while that, it, that it explains why I'm attracted this way and tempted to sin this way, it explains but does not excuse what the Bible says, what the Bible says commands and demands of me in terms of sexual purity, faithfulness, etc. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, really quickly, if um, we can just touch back on Leviticus 18. Um, if I understand correctly, Ryan's point was that that specific line in that specific chapter refers specifically to actions within temple context or... Pagan temple worship, yeah. Pagan temple worship. Yep. So, as in, like, these are things that would occur inside of a pagan temple? Yeah. Uh, uh, Male prostitution was common in pagan temple worship. Yeah. Because my, my concern would be verse 24 and 25 in the same context, right? Yeah. Specifically says, because of these things, all the nations, in the Hebrew word going, used there, refers to the Gentiles, have been categorized as unclean. And as a result, vomited. Wouldn't that say that this doesn't just apply to like inside of temple worship, but just yeah? Well, I think I think his, his yeah. ultimate argument is that this is part of the ceremonial law related to, to the to the worship of God in the temple that's been now fulfilled in Christ, and not part of the moral law. He wouldn't commit on what part of the law it was. I pressed that, him. Well, to, yeah. yeah, but your your I'm point certain. is exactly right. That, that's Contextually, philologically, in terms of the actual Hebrew words that are being used, lexically and contextually, it is an unsustainable assertion. It doesn't even rise to the point of a legitimate argument. It's an unsustainable assertion. So y your eagle eye there has caught yeah. contextually what is uh, part of the problem with the assertion. Yep. Um, you know, with him not being here, I don't, I don't want to speak for him. I will say, uh, generically, he um, sort of methodologically proceeds along the lines that um, the church's teaching on a number of things has changed. And um, he, he, 
he tried to, I want to say this. Yeah, I think he asserted that, but he never followed up on it. There, there were a few, Abby, there were a yeah. few kind of tossing something out, but not landing the plane. Yeah. I think in the Leviticus, he was, he was essentially the second making argument, perhaps in the Old Testament, because salvation at that point was biologically tied to procreation of children. Yeah. That they really push procreation, but since that's fulfilled in Christ, he did do that. Marriage is no longer requires procreation. And that is 110% wrong. That, 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 that procreation of but children. I've heard that argument. So yeah. Again, and so now, in other words, yeah. now it doesn't matter. Marriage yeah, the now it doesn't just matter. About and, and covenant that, fidelity. <laughs> Yeah, it's so not that marriage own. was only about that or that now it's not about the procreation of children. The procreation of children is an aspect of marriage. If God's will is for a couple to be able to, to physically have children, that is a part of the purpose of marriage, but it's not that that was the whole purpose of it and now it's changed to something else or that salvation was ever tied to the procreation of children. Salvation was never tied to the procreation of children. Salvation and, and the covenant was never tied to ethnicity, right? Abraham... And, and this is like, so Abraham's circumcision was not the sign of his ethnicity or his Jewishness. If, it, if that were the case, it would have been a horrible sign because all nations circumcised except for the Philistines. The, Abraham's circumcision and salvation was never a matter of nationality or ethnicity or bloodline. His circumcision was a sign of the righteousness he had by faith. In other words, salvation has always been a matter of the gospel, belief in the gospel. So I think... Um, yeah, he, he attempted to go in that direction. Abby never really got there. There, there I mean, I'm just going to say there, there weren't a lot of consistent logical lines of argumentation so is it, proceeding. Is it the case with you know, y'all who are, are pastors and who are dealing with affirming pastors who claim to have an orthodox reform hermeneutic? that what essentially happened kind of distilled it to this. Hey, that was ceremonial. The ceremonial law has been fulfilled in Christ. Therefore, it can be modified legitimately this way. Yep. I think that was part of what was going on. But that's an argument for only one text. But, so. <laughs> but that's the argument. Yep. So, so in that ceremonial law being being filled in Christ, that can safely be modified mm -hmm. to, be, to be a reflection of what the original was, but, but that's, the, that's the theological legitim legitimize. That's the effort to theologically legitimize it. Now, this is really important. Hang with me. I know we're, we're long and we probably need to wrap up because I wanna, don't want to keep you all here forever, but, but I'm about to devastate that argument in pretty much one fell swoop. Two things. To suggest that that is the ceremonial law uh, when it is actually a reflection of the holiness code of the moral law of, uh, of because in other words, the, the law about adultery is not, is not just thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, if I were to say to you, the Bible says don't commit adultery in the Ten Commandments, that's the moral law. The moral law is binding but since the Bible doesn't, since the Ten Commandments don't say anything about pedophilia or bestiality or fornication or pornography, all I got to avoid is adultery. Well, guess what? I'll, I'll avoid adultery by never getting married. And I'll just indulge myself sexually for the rest of my life. And I'm keeping that commandment. Well, of course, nobody, well, somebody might try to argue that way. But um, so to, to, to suggest that Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13 are ceremonial and not an extension of the moral law, which I asked last night. I said, do you believe this is civil, ceremonial, or, uh, or uh, moral? I said, it has to be one of the three. And he said, yes, it has to be one of the three. And I said, you've already told me that the civil and ceremonial have been fulfilled. And so are you going to tell me that this law no longer is abiding? If it's civil or ceremonial, it, it no longer, it's been fulfilled, and it's longer abiding. And if you're going to do that, you have to then prove that the other moral imperatives in that same chapter, which is what Sebastian was getting at here, are also no longer uh, abiding. He wasn't going to go there. And so he basically said, well, we have a low degree of certainty about this. And since I, I and so I said, so you have a low degree of certainty about it. I asked him, does the Bible have a low degree of certainty about what it's saying, regardless of what you and I think? I said, does the Bible have a low degree of certainty? And his response was, well, 
No, the Bible doesn't have a low degree of certainty, but what if I feel a low degree of certainty? What should I do? And so I responded with the adultery thing. Surely you wouldn't tell me, since I have a low degree of certainty about adultery, let me, and he said, well, no, I wouldn't say that. But here's the thing that I didn't bring up because I felt like I was piling on, to be honest with you. But here's, here's the devastation of that argument. And listen carefully. If I try to say what's going on in Leviticus 18, 22 and 2013 is ceremonial. I assert that it's ceremonial. Though clearly, as Sebastian's pointing out, eh, I don't see that contextually. Then what I must do is account for the fact that when Paul uses the words arsene and koimetis and coins the phrase uh, arsenikomatai in the Greek in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 1 Timothy 1, 10. Notice that Paul does not employ that language with any reference to temple worship. So, did Paul misread? Did Paul not understand that that was ceremonial? Why is Paul bringing it back up? in 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy in a non-pagan temple worship setting or in a non-ceremonial law setting. So even if I say it's pagan temple worship or if I say it's about the ceremonial law, somebody should have told Paul because he missed it. Do you follow me? Do you feel me? In other words, it is an unsustainable argument philologically, lexically, in terms of the meaning of the words. And it's also an unsustainable argument contextually, and it's an unsustainable argument in terms of the way the New Testament reads and interprets the Old Testament. Why? Well, it is one o'clock. I think we want to thank you so much for this morning. My pleasure. So good. To be, and, uh, thank you all for Rich giving up your Saturday to come uh, be here. Thank you all. My suspicion is that there's a little food left. There's in food table. left in here, and let me say this. Um, my number is easy to remember, 615, that's Nashville, all right? If you've never been to Nashville, come down and see me. I'll take you to get some hot chicken, okay? Nashville, Tennessee, 615-828, like Romans 828. <laughs> ah, Rosette, you're thinking, what a nerd this guy is. <laughs> you see Rosette, roll her eyes at me. So 615-828, and the year of the Reformation, 1517. Uh, that's, get that that's okay. So when AT and T, that was back then, they said that you choose your own number, and they already had eight two eight was the prefix that you were. I thought well, that's Romans eight twenty seven. I said, is one five one seven taken? And he looked. He said, no. Why do you want that? I said, trust me. Got it. <laughs> Glad you asked. So Romans eight six one five Romans eight twenty eight and the year of the Reformation fifteen seventeen. Text me, call me. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, uh, email me. You can email me at dfilson at wts.edu, and I'll get back with you. It may take me a day or two to get back with you, but I'll always get back with you. You've got questions, thoughts, comments, you want to interact, uh, get a hold of me. Such a pleasure to be with you all. Thanks for welcoming uh, Diane and Lydia and Gabby and me. Uh, much love to you all. And uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Maybe, Chad, you could close this in prayer. Yeah, just a couple things, Aaron. Anything we need to know about food? Yes, there are to go boxes that can. There you go. So grab some things, stick them on. There you go. So fill up the books and food because you don't want to haul those back in your trunk. <laughs> well, you'll take some food. <laughs> <laughs> don't take all the food. So Aaron gets no, some. I'm kidding. Take all the food. No, that's good. Yeah, it, I think all of you are probably going away, but if you need anywhere to worship, 930 at Borg Kilo tomorrow morning, right? Yep. I'm actually preaching in Zealand at North Street. Ah, so you won't even be here so around the corner. Here at, so you can Central Down the road. Street, uh, 930 as well too, but you're welcome to join us. And pray, I kind of say, pray for pastors like Chad and Stephen who are fighting the good fight in a, for, for all of us as pastors, the pressure on us right now, um, trust me, y'all, any one of the three of us as pastors could face jail time in the not too distant future because of our stance on some of these things. We could be accused of hate speech. We could have our bank accounts locked down. These things are upon it. Let, let, us, not, let us not pretend, let, let us not be naive. We must be like the sons of Issachar, knowing the time, discerning the times. And so pray for godly pastors like this who are uh, willing to, to take these stands.
Father, we thank you that uh, it destroys all principalities and powers. And so, Lord, we just pray that that would be true uh, even among us, but in our nations, but, Lord, even in our own hearts, too, as we, are, we buy into the lies so easily. But, Father, if we would have been there standing in the garden, we would have fallen exactly the same. So, Lord, we just pray that you would uh, continue to walk with us. And, Lord, we, we pray for our churches. We pray for our pastors. We pray for our seminaries and all of those who are are guiding and leading the next generations in your truth. We pray, Lord, that you would bring reformation. You would bring revival. You'd bring renewal to your church. And that can only be done by your spirit. But, Father, we pray that you would drive your people to you by that spirit, that we would stand upon your word. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this time, for this great fellowship, and for these, these friends, old and new, that uh, we've been able to connect with. And, Lord, would you use us for your glory and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.